Ladies and gentlemen, your 930 speakeasy. Thank you. Thank you, Deirdre. I'm uh, extraordinarily excited to be here. I, I've been hearing about the legendary Full Frame Festival for years, and it's clearly the preeminent doc festival on the planet. So, And the doc filmmakers are my rock stars, so I'm really, really thrilled to be here. Um, and just so you, if you, if, to the extent you think there's any collusion, we've all met for the first time this morning. So this is, this is speakeasy unplugged. Uh, I'll just be refereeing for the most part. They call it moderating, but we'll see. Um, I think that uh, I'll just read you briefly what the, uh, what, the, what the festival thinks this panel should be. And I can tell you <laughs> with certainty from experience that it will morph in true gonzo journalistic style into something else, um, and, and as it should. Uh, it'll be free form and fun, I hope. If not, you can egg us later. So the shifting sands of programming, theatrical cable, pay cable, VOD, documentaries are more prevalent than ever. How are the companies that create and or distribute these films dealing with the rapidly shifting landscape of documentary programming? Is there a model for documentary programming to be profitable? Can public television still support these films within their given mandate? Uh, and the only thing I would add here is that literally the, the companies that create and or distribute in some, some in, in some instances, are, are an individual with a flip phone and a computer, and you know, twenty-five dollars from their piggy bank. That's the beauty of the documentary world, because theoretically, anyone could enter this arena, and it's changing the world if done properly. <coughs> changing the world if done improperly, in some respects. Um, without further ado, I'll, I'll let these these great panelists introduce themselves, and then we'll have at it. Jason, I guess I'm first. Does this work? Hey, I'm Jason Janego, as Deirdre mentioned. Um, let me first start by saying that uh, my business partner, colleague, and close friend, Tom Quinn, who I've worked with for, I guess, probably eight years now, uh, is a Tar Heel and is really disappointed that he actually couldn't be sitting in this chair. But he is in the state of North Carolina. He's actually in Asheville, uh, attending another film festival this weekend, a film festival called Action Fest, which you can all, I'm sure, guess what that one's about. <laughs> Um, something that he started a few years ago. Uh, Tom and I uh, joined the Weinstein Company about seven or eight months ago to start a, a boutique uh, label for Harvey and Bob that focuses on uh, multi-platform distribution. We are two of the sort of original people at Magnolia. Um, I left earlier than, than Tom did, and the goal here for us at Radius is to try and take the multi-platform uh, model that uh, that we learned a lot from trial and error at Magnolia, and try and take to uh, the next level, which means some bigger movies, bigger bigger uh, cast on the narrative side, um, spend a little more a little bit more money, which is always fun, uh, and then utilize sort of some of the, the the things that Harvey and Bob their experience, their skills, etc., bring to the table. So we put together a slate of uh, over twelve films already. First release is going to happen sometime later this summer. We have yet to slot a documentary, but it's something that's very important to us. Uh, at Magnolia, we've worked on lots of documentaries, and, and I still find myself at every film festival I attend going to see more docs than I probably should, considering what my job is, knowing that a lot of them are films that I probably wouldn't acquire for distribution, but I love, love, love documentaries so much, especially music docs. That's my sort of as far as film, uh, film going is concerned. So that's me. All right, I'm James Ackerman. I'm the CEO of Documentary Channel. And um, as a guy who runs a young, relatively early stage uh, television network, um, I'm having to navigate my way through a bit of a minefield at the moment because the operators on whom I'm dependent looking at the sort of video landscape and saying, okay, Netflix, Hulu, you know, this and that are becoming a problem. And so that we find ourselves under tremendous pressure to make sure that our content remains exclusive to them or is provided on an on-demand on basis to them on an authenticated basis. So um, there are lots of challenges for you all who produce and create content as you sort of have to kind of navigate this minefield as well and know that if you, you know, you know, 
want to distribute online in a certain form, it may preclude your distribution or, or block distribution on other fronts. And I'm sure we'll unpack all that, so I won't get into too much of that. But um, I find myself kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum from maybe where you find yourself, Jason, in terms of what we're facing and the pressures we're under. Um, my name is Andrew Guitaro. I'm the coordinating producer of POV. It, in public media, we're on a totally different spectrum. I hope to talk about that a little bit. Um, if you don't know POV, June through September primetime series on PBS will be moving to Thursday nights um, starting in June. Uh, we are celebrating our 25th anniversary. I am celebrating my 28th anniversary <laughs> this year. So Happy birthday. I have not been around, you know, for the entire history of POV. <laughs> but, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the shifting sands of public media in this panel. Um, we do curate through an open call, so if there are filmmakers in the audience, which I'm sure there are, in two days, um, we're going to announce the open call for the 26th season of POV. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that process as well and how to get your films um, in prime time on PBS. I'm Molly Thompson, and I run a feature documentary division for A&E, and um, everywhere our branding is here it's all over the place over there Sonia Lanyard but we have a big commitment to full frame uh, because it's such a wonder it's, it's such a great place to highlight nonfiction filmmaking and uh, a and &E, since this panel is about distribution a and &E is a you know top five cable network it has had I think eight consecutive years of, of growth and the reason I mention that because I'm not really on the business side but I think if we're talking about distribution it's important to look at the big picture um, and a and &E also is, um, it's, it's a, one of the networks that James, I suppose, aspires to, to turn the documentary channel into. So it's fully distributed in almost 100 million homes, um, and it's also ad supported. So I think you know, it's good for filmmakers to know sort of the business background. In addition, we, we make a lot of content. So we, we are the network that's gonna go 100% original content by the end of this year. That means no more movies, no more CSI, no more Murder, She Wrote. Um, and, I know, I like the hard ones. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's been off for like 10 years. I just think that's funny. <laughs> um, so, a, in addition, we make, we make documentaries, we make features. Um, and so what I do is I run a boutique within the network to make feature, you know, some top feature documentaries that will be seen for years and have a lasting impact on, on the nonfiction landscape. Uh, some, of, some of the films that we've seen have premiered here. We have two films here this year. We have Under African Skies, which is about Paul Simon and Graceland. Jason, you might be interested in that one. And but he goes back to- He's seen it already. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. <laughs> he, and, and the other film is The Imposter, which is um, a really, I think, innovative way to tell a story. Bart Layton, the director of that, will be here later in the festival. So anyway, that's that's who I am. You want to back to you, Steve? Uh, sure. <laughs> sort of. Uh, <coughs> sadly, the the economic model and prospects for those of us that make documentary films uh, is pretty grim. Uh, there are an occasion, occasional breakouts. There are some success stories. All of us documentary filmmakers and w uh, would love to be and honored to be you know, hosted on any of your platforms. Um, and I can uh, say with certainty that it's, it's a very, very difficult road to hoe in terms of making money from the, from the content creator's point of view, unless the content creator is, our, is you guys, right. actually, you know, build your library and know exactly how to roll out your content and make money on it. But I think what we should really discuss, um, unless there are any objections, um, is, more the acquisition world. I mean, I think from Molly's point of view, if you're gonna make content, that's great, but I would assume you guys are looking for seasoned filmmakers that you know you know can deliver for you. I'm not certain of that, but maybe you can address new talent and what, what it is you guys look for. Um, I think it's important for any of you to address what you would pay for content and in what, for, for what rights and what duration. Um, and I think that it's also important for you to encourage to the extent that there's any encouraging to be had. Um, those filmmakers out there that are, that are struggling to make important content, um, 
uh, how they could literally see some benefit from it other than you know the glory of it and a decent review. So if anybody wants to have that, you know, in many respects, you know, the, the simple question is what of what you're looking for, what you would pay for that, uh, and how somebody could reap the benefits of that. I think it'd be important for the for the guests here. I don't actually do a lot of acquisition, just for the record. I mean, we once in a while, I've, I acquired page one for the History Channel, uh, which was not called the History Channel anymore. It's History, uh, History Films. I acquired uh, Countdown to Zero for History also. But basically, we produce films. And so, and, and you know, I, I beg to differ. We actually do develop new talent. We, Heidi and Rachel, and when they had done Jesus Camp, they for, when they did that for us, um, I went to see Boys of Baraka, which was their first feature, and I liked it. And, ended up giving them development money, which is one of the good things about television networks. They have, you know, they have money that they can give you so that you can, as a filmmaker, go out and explore an idea. None of us know if a character is going to be a great character until you shoot with them for a couple days. So the good thing about, you know, the networks is that they can do that very easily. They're used to doing it. They do it on the, the series side all the time. Um, and in terms of, <coughs> you know, making a living, part of the reason I, I mentioned all the number of hours of nonfiction is that I know a lot of people who are making quite a bit decent living in, you know, reality shows, and then they they take some time off and they go and make their feature doc. So there are ways to make it happen. Um, and when we take on a, a feature, we it gets a decent budget. So that's the good news. I know it's frustrating because everybody wants you know a decent budget for all their films, but you know we we treat it like it, it, uh, you know a proper nonfiction feature should be treated. And so, you know, that's our, that's to, to address some of the things that you raised. Yeah, it, it, as far as acquisitions are concerned, it, you know, it's interesting because Molly keeps naming a number of films that I keep forgetting all the movies that we've actually worked on together, both films that I've acquired or helped acquire, um, films that I help sell with Molly. It's, it's very interesting. But as far as the acquisitions on the documentary side, what makes it continually difficult to sort of put together um, a number if that makes sense is a lot of times uh, because of the way that documentaries need to get made and funded a lot of the rights are already tied up and so for a company like mine which we're trying to do all rights deals oftentimes it's tricky to try and come up with a deal that makes sense because you've already got a television deal in place Molly's company is, is one of those that actually I think does an amazing job of working with distributors who are handling all the other the other media rights um, to try and figure out a deal that makes sense. But a lot of times, it's very difficult when, you, when I'm looking at something and I know you already have a television deal or you're already tied up from some other sort of funding source. We had a film that we looked at recently, a documentary that um, part of, they already had a deal in place with Facebook for distribution. And it's like, well, that completely changes my calculation for what I would do with the film. So that makes it a little bit more difficult. There are also some other areas, such as um, one of the things that has happened uh, recently um, is, maybe not so recently, but the value for DVD, the DVD numbers in the documentary business continue to, to decrease dramatically. So it's very difficult to, to sort of um, count on some of the revenue numbers that you might get from a narrative uh, feature versus a documentary. Also, when you're looking at some of the other uh, media when you're, you're going through the, the different windows, um, some of them, they tend to discount um, the, the price that they would pay for a documentary based upon the fact that it's a doc. They treat it the, the same way that they would a foreign language film or a black and white film, oddly enough. Even stuff that they know is going to be valuable, that's just the way that their deals have been set up. And I'm talking like about Netflix and things like that. Some of the, some of the pay TV, they, they tend to discount. So as far as trying to come up with that number for acquisition, it's really, really difficult. The doc side. Well, and you and you, the buyers and the end users are really uh, on, in total control because without some sort of a venue or platform, we have nothing. When you mentioned the the deal with, forgive me for digressing for a moment, the deal with Facebook, um, did you mean that that was a plus for you as you rethought the deal or, or a liability? Uh, it was a liability because I wanted to do that, and it was very important to the filmmakers that they were going to hold that back. So that was one of those things where I get it. If you're a filmmaker or you're a producer or financier and that's important to you, that's fantastic and you should go and do it. But you're going to potentially narrow the number of people, distributors that are interested in doing it because I want to be able to control as many of those rights as I possibly can. 
both for purposes of, of controlling what happens, but also just the revenue. Jason, was that announced, what movie that was? Because, what the hell, is it public? Um, it is because I know about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, know, I, I don't know if I'm able to say what movie I, I heard is, a movie announced, and I can't remember which one it was, but um, do you remember? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm more curious about whether anybody knows what the economic impact is of Facebook. Like, no clue. No clue, right. It's no totally untouched. But that, that well, was marketing actually, tool, it's got to be a plus. So but, but that was actually part of the deal, is we wanted to, to learn. And that was a film that made sense. We thought, okay, there's some built-in value here that we could actually learn a hell of a lot about what the Facebook impact really is. And also the Facebook, how many people actually go and watch something on Facebook? That's, a, that's an entire panel for next year. <laughs> in fact, in Facebook, I'm not going to Well, we, um, we, we acquire 150 to 200 unique titles a year. So um, that's the good news. Uh, the, the bad news is our license fees are low, just because of the economics of our size as compared to A&E, to, to which we aspire. Um, and, uh, um, and so, you know, we are you know, premiering, you know, on average, a new documentary film in primetime every other night. And so we, to feed the machine, we have to acquire a lot of product. And we do, uh, you know, a handful of package deals every year with uh, niche distributors uh, um, uh, that come to us and, you know, come to the film festivals and acquire product. But generally speaking, the majority of what we acquire are one-off films made by individual filmmakers who are, you know, the producer is approaching us and saying, I have a film and you know, I'd like you to take a look at it. And it's why we are so keen on uh, festivals like this one. You know, we're here in full force. You know, we've got five people from the company uh, you know, here, including our head of acquisitions, our, our head of programming, our head of production, our head of marketing and business development, the CEO of the company, and another producer. So you know, it's, you know, we, we have to feed the machine. But again, our license fees are low. What does low mean? The range is as low as $5,000 per title to $25,000 per title. We sometimes go above that. We sometimes go below that. We literally will have somebody submit to us a film that you know they just want to have on their resume that they were on Documentary Channel, and they give it to us for free. So you know there are exceptions, but generally speaking, that is the range in which we operate. So it's pretty straightforward for us. Um, we're primarily acquisitions, 14 to 16 films a year. Um, and there's a base acquisition rate of $525 a minute um, for 52 and 82 minute films. It's a priority for us to feature emerging filmmakers in the schedule um, alongside established filmmakers. So we'll do, uh, last year, The Beaches of Agnes. Agnes Juarez's uh, film got a two hour slot and we filled it with a short film by a Stanford filmmaker. So that's my example of pairing an emerging and established filmmaker. Um, this year we have Patricio Guzman's Nostalgia for the Light and a couple of films um, that are featured debuts. Um, the, in terms of rights, it's uh, four releases in six years, um, or three and four um, premieres, and many of our films go on to second window showings. It's like interesting that you brought Poison Baraka, that production funding. Uh, premiere and showing on the documentary channel Sunday. Yeah. Great film and good case study, I think, for today. Uh, I, um, Molly, did you have something? Oh, um, I would argue that the majority of the docs out there will never find a home or haven't found a home. And while you buy 150 docs, there's probably 1,500 of them that go you know, unnoticed or lie fallow. Um, might be interesting if any of you could address, or all of you, uh, ways in which people can draw attention to their unseen docs lying fallow, find ways in which to market them in a grassroots fashion for literally a dollar, and if they do do that um, to get attention for their docs, is this something that A, you would encourage, B, what would you encourage them, how would you encourage them to do it, uh, and C, um, have you picked up docs that have been around for a long, long time that you finally discover because somebody has done something creative in which to bring it to your attention? Well, one example um, that I would mention is uh, we have a relationship with the 
Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences where we fund the restoration of documentary films. And um, through that experience, I would say that we have learned about films, older films, um, which had been distributed through television, broadcast television, before the days of cable, or on some limited theatrical distribution, or you know, had one showing in one location. Um, and <coughs> we're able to work with the Academy and, and restore those films, and then bring them to the television channel. Uh, there are three films uh, that were, had been made by John Huston, for example, and we funded the restoration of those three films and then brought them to the channel. And they were very little known films, but in World War II, John Huston worked for Frank Capra as a cameraman documenting battle scenes, and um, and uh, and so we were, you know, we worked with the Academy. We did a screening of these films at the Linwood Dunn Theater on Pine Street, which is where the Academy Archive is. Had a panel discussion, and then a week later premiered them on the channel. So that's kind of an example. I think I would just emphasize uh, the importance of the festival circuit on films like this. I mean, this is my first time uh, at Full Frame. It's my first time in Durham since I made it like a college visit, maybe to Duke back in 19. <coughs> um, <laughs> uh, but just looking at, the, at the, the slate of films here and the people that are attending and all the rest of it, you're just like, wow, these are films that, these are amazing films that unfortunately will probably not be seen by a wide audience, but there are people here that are really interested in these things and want to see these movies. And you can find that at, at a lot of other film festivals across the country. So, you know, while it's difficult to find sort of a permanent home that's going to put money in the pocket of that filmmaker, unfortunately, I still feel like the festival circuit is such a vital way for you to get these films seen. And ideally, you know, you might find somebody, one of us up here, or the, the number of other sort of um, film executives. Uh, who, are, who, are, who are trolling the halls of these things, looking for something that speaks to them. So I know it's a little old fashioned, but I still think that the, the film festival circuit is incredibly important for, for these types of films. One thing that POV does, I think, um, that's unique even among uh, public media is our outreach and engagement um, package comes along with each acquisition fee, you know, a bundle uh, of both public libraries that um, have worked with us over 25 years to show all the films in our schedule. We send out DVDs on a non-exclusive um, outreach and engagement um, deal, community organizations, uh, colleges, and, and high schools. And then on the filmmaker side, they are still able to sell rights, so a way that, again, you can make money without, if your film's not getting our outreach and engagement package because it's not being broadcast on POV, well, outreach is a way to find the audiences that are interested in your film with issue films, <coughs> with social issue films. There's always an audience. It's not the general public of the United States of America, necessarily. Um, but if you can't get on PBS to reach that general public, you can find them. We call them micro audiences, which is a sad term. But uh, we've addressed that on the POV blog, because we have 14 to 16 slots a year. It's not that many. It's not even triple digits. Um, so there's ways to find them. I don't really know a thing about grassroots marketing, but I will say this one year I was here with September issue, which was being distributed by Roadside Attractions. I was like, I walked out of a, probably a panel and I saw this line around the block and I was like, oh, that's appropriate, that's cool, that's for my film. But in fact, it was for Helvetica. <laughs> that, that guy, yeah. Gary Husswood, really knows what he's doing. So <laughs> he's the one to find you know, the answers from. <laughs> Just, just as an aside, uh, maybe you reminded me, my, uh, my friend, and Molly's friend too, Mark Simon, who's a, he's an entertainment attorney, and he works like crazy at his real job, but he also finds time to make these documentaries, and he made um, After Innocence, I don't know if any of you yeah. guys have seen that film about people who had been uh, released from death row by the Innocence Project several years ago, he made that film. He has a film coming out today um, about Mark Dreyer, who was an attorney and a Ponzi schemer. And it basically chronicles his last days before he goes away to prison. Uh, and Mark has spent several years making that film, and he sort of cobbled together different, toward, uh, different deals for different types of media. And he's just sending out blasts, email blasts, Facebook blasts, Twitter blasts. You know, he sent one to me last night and said, can you please, please you know, put this out on your Twitter feed or your Facebook feed? 
Like he's just, you know, I don't know how he finds time to do it, but he does it. And I think in that, that's a good example of every little bit helps. As the, I saw the Drive documentary, the, the heart-wrenching part was he had to part ways with his dog. Yeah. Really was a tough one. Um, I want to dig a teeny bit deeper, and, and if, if it's not something that's of interest, we can obviously move on. But um, I'm, I was really referring to a, a step down the, in, in the grassroots roots world. I'm not trying to challenge you, Molly. Um, but there are so many films that don't see the light of day. I promise you, in them are a, in, in there is a gem or two or five. Um, and a lot of these people, I would argue most of them globally, don't even have the money to submit to the myriad festivals that there are out there. Uh, 25, 50, 100, 200 dollars, whatever it is, times the 50, 100, 200, 500 festivals there are, doesn't give these people a prayer of even being in the festival world. Um, so I think it would really be important um, for us to address, again, ways in which people can draw attention to people like you for films that would never ever see the light of day that need to be seen, and most of them are crap, I give you that. Um, and are, are, you know, you want that 90 minutes of your life back, but you want to sue them for having told you to watch it. But, but there are gems out there, and, and is there a way? Can some of these people take, you know, five, seven, ten minutes of these movies, cut them into a really exciting teaser or uh, something, some morsel that they can stream online, for instance, uh, see if they can get, you know, you know, some, 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 some quony type traction and, and bring it to the attention of folks like you. Or launch a Kickstarter campaign. Yeah. <clears throat> and we come Kickstarter constantly looking for new projects. Mm -hmm. Saturday night, tomorrow night, uh, is the world premiere of a film called The Bus uh, about the VW bus. It's a very simple film. And it's about the cultural influence of the VW bus and how the VW bus was influenced by culture at the time. We found that film on Kickstarter. We made a contribution to that film on Kickstarter, and the filmmaker raised all of his money like that. And so we're now beginning to do that more. We're looking for interesting projects. It's not to say that we're not having behind the scenes conversation with the filmmaker as well to figure out, you know, what's this all about and everything. We're not just making our judgment based on what we see on Kickstarter. But we do see on Kickstarter as an interesting way for us to get involved in original projects. I love that 16 window VW bus, the old one. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about that and I'm very impressed that you perused Kickstarter for, for that. Are you asking? How, how long is the film? Uh, the film is about 40 minutes, 50 minutes, I think. That, that, yeah, that, I was just thinking about when you mentioned Coney and something like mm. that. I just wonder about the idea that, I mean, a lot of people watched Coney because how long was that? 22 minutes. 22 minutes? I feel like uh, for a lot of these films, there, there's something to the idea of spending 90 minutes with the subject that you could probably tell the story in 22 minutes <laughs> or 40 minutes. So I'm curious, and this is something that Tom and I actually talk about um, in our 36 hour days that we have. Um, is there some sort of a, a market out there for films that aren't 90 minutes, but aren't 10? Is there something in between that makes sense? That, and how do you price it? How do you distribute it? Where does it go? I think that's an actually a very, very interesting concept for the future, especially in the doc world. Because a lot of these, you know, you, you, we've all seen them where the first 30 minutes, you're like, I'm so in, and then it just kind of, you know, is this a story here? Yeah, to your point, I think in social media, yeah. the shorter the better. The more concise the story is, the better. Uh, I will say that we do look for shorts because we don't uh, ask filmmakers to cut their films down. And so we're desperate to get back to the top of the hour by salting in you know, 10 and 15 and 8 minute long documentary films. Well, conversely, if you, if you stumble across a, a short that's compelling and that you love, that you want more of, uh, would you go to that filmmaker and say, do you have any more footage? Can you expand this to you know, feature length doc? Uh, is that a possibility in your world? Uh, I, we haven't done it yet, but yes, I don't see a reason why it couldn't be a possibility. That has happened, but I, I think it's rare. And once a story's been told, how do you retell it? How do you expand upon it? You know, I think that's tricky. Um, but, you know, I think a big part of the filmmaker's job is to be able to get their story across to people who don't, are busy or bored or disinterested. And so you have to, you've got to pitch. I hate it. I'm horrible at pitching. Mm -hmm. But I, it's it's a necessary evil. You have to be able to do it, and you have to be able to, to be political enough and 
charming enough and, and get your way through to, to people who, you know, if, if that's your goal. And the, <clears throat> the length that you mentioned, seven or eight minutes, can be helpful. I was talking to John Albert at DCTV, who, I mean, this is an anecdote, I think, from back in the day before he had a staff, but he would <laughs> work on like an eight minute, 30 minute, 56 minute and 86 minute cut of his film all at the same time. Um, yeah, it, it's a little nuts, but um, you know, that's funding, that's does it work as a half an hour, that's international sales, and that's my dream of showing it at a festival. I think, I mean, uh, from a workflow standpoint, if, if you're like struggling whether you can keep this shot in the film, well, like put it in one of your other versions that you're working on. Um, whether everybody's gonna leave this room and then go start working on three more versions of their film, I don't know. But it was really interesting to talk to him about, so. I think the eight minute funding piece is really important for getting our attention, and uh, certainly of, of funders more so than broadcasters. If there had been a feature length version of the Coney film available on VOD that week, it would have sold, right? People would have bought that, probably. Um, I, I've, I've been in situations where I've found that the uh, my, my liability becomes my asset in documentary filmmaking, uh, i.e. if the less money I have, strangely enough, uh, over time becomes an asset to the film. Um, for instance, I, I, I was involved in a documentary that I started 10 years ago on an on a underground artist named Robert Williams called Mr. Bitchin', and nobody wanted to do it, so I mean, I, I you know, I got involved, it, a little bit had been shot, but then I started throwing some air miles at it and $5,000 here and there and a few cameras and some interns from my office. And over the years, it started to grow. Over the years, it started to take, you know, uh, root and more money got put into it. More money got put into that. Um, and it, over 10 years evolved into a way better and way more interesting and compelling movie and portrait of this man than it would have been had I been given three hundred or five hundred thousand dollars then to make a movie about this guy which I would have had to deliver in six months to you. So uh, are there, I mean A, I think that's a really exciting ray of hope and B, are there movies you would ultimately see as a work in progress, uh, I, 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 I think the answer is yes, I hope so, um, and, and complete, and give the completion funds to, I would imagine that would be in the form of, of whatever advance you'd pay, and that's all the filmmaker would see, but if that's what it takes to get it done and out there, um, I think that's a good trade-off, and is that some, uh, a business model that you, or uh, well, it's not really a business model, is that a, uh, is that something you guys look at? And have you stumbled across something that you've finished the, the funding of that has turned out to be something special for you? Yeah, there's a <clears throat> film made by N.C. Hyken, a first time filmmaker, called Kim Jong Ilya. And um, N.C. Uh, is, her husband is a publisher in Paris. And she was attending a human rights conference with her husband and heard the story of this young man uh, who had grown up in prison camp in North Korea, and he uh, and his friend attempted to escape. His friend did not make it uh, because his friend, it turned out, shorted out the electric fence. Um, and he got through and got all the way to South Korea. And so this film is chronicles the story of seven or eight people who have had exactly this experience of escaping from North Korea and the egregious human rights abuses, which we don't really hear about enough. We hear about, you know, testing missiles and this and that. but don't hear enough about the human rights abuses and escaping to South Korea. Well, she came to us and needed finishing funds. I mean, she just needed to finish the film. And so, again, while our license fees are low, you know, we were able to provide the amount of money that she needed to finish the film, and that became our license fee for the film. Um, I mean, our model would be like the opposite of what was being talked about earlier. If you can get a broadcast commitment from VOV, which we do early on uh, sometimes, Completion funding will come if it's not from us. Just having the stamp that this is going to get a national broadcast on PBS is like a magnet um, for getting you the money to finish it. Um, that being said, we do, we're getting more and more involved in, in providing completion funds to films. Um, Give Up Tomorrow this year is an example. They were showing us some early footage. Uh, we 
made a commitment, I'm not sure at what point in the process, but then they ended up getting funding from all types of places. If you, <laughs> the start of that film, it's like 25 seconds until you threw all the logos at the head. Mm -hmm. And they've had great success. We actually came into a film last year, uh, right at the end of the year, that ended up going to Sundance called Corman's World. And it's a documentary about Roger Corman. And it's really, really good, I think. And they just needed that little bit of you know push for the final uh, uh, to get the finishing line at Sundance. We also did that with uh, with My Kid Could Paint That, which is Amir Barlev's first film that he did with us. And um, he then went on to do The Tillman Story, which Jason worked on with us uh, at Sundance a couple of years ago before he was at Radius. But um, Amir had, you know, he, he cobbled together the money from, you know, a British license fee and the truth, I don't know where he got the rest of it before he came to us, but he needed that last bit of money to finish the film to get to Sundance. You know, and then what we do is we come in and we help them, if, if a film gets into Sundance, we help them, you know, pay for, the, in that case, we pay for the family to travel to Sundance, and we pay for the poster and stuff like that. So. Yeah, in, in my world, we would normally wait until the film was finished and, and have a look, but I mean, like every other rule, there are exceptions. Uh, back at Magnolia, uh, Tom and I uh, convinced uh, our owners, uh, Mark Cuban and Todd Wagner, to uh, help finance um, Outrage, which is Kirby Dick's doc about uh, the hypocrisy of certain um, members of government towards the gay and lesbian community. Uh, and we got into that project pretty early, and everyone was really thrilled with that. Um, and then, you know, we, when we were there also, there were a few of the of Alex Gibney's projects that we help finance. The difference being, in those cases, obviously, these are filmmakers who have had some track record of success. So it was a lot easier for us to write a good-sized check to make their film. Um, with, with Amir's movie, The Tillman Story, <coughs> which was terrific, and he's a lovely guy, and he's, he's actually doing a, a Grateful Dead biography now, yeah. strangely enough. Um, you finished the film, presumably, uh, to secure the rights for your uh, for yourself, and you found that uh, I'm just, you know, sort of uh, putting it out there. I'm assuming you found that it had a bigger life, and it could be theatrically released, and it could be nominated, which I believe it was. Um, how often do you guys acquire something that you feel is best to try and uh, unveil in a, in a in a theatrical sense or in a larger way? then you can, can do it to increase its potential and obviously its value to you as a secondary always. Uh, run. Always. That's our model. That's a pretty good description of what we always do. I mean, we, <clears throat> the fact of the matter is with A&E's growth and the changes in, in the schedule, the um, documentary slots, the, the one-off slots are few and far between. So we've enjoyed seeing the films go off and generate as you know uh, much attention and uh, a little bit of revenue if possible um, and have have a proper life and and we feel that it helps the films to be you know have a lasting impact you know, so so it's a, it's a film that can live a lot longer so you know even certain films that air on pay cable you know I feel no matter how good they are they sort of come and go you know and uh, don't get to necessarily be appreciated for in, in the proper way for as long as possible so that is our model and to that end, <coughs> um, you know, we do pick up films in second window, a um, fair number. So films coming off HBO, coming off a &E, coming off of, um, you know, Showtime and what have you, uh, you know, we'll pick up those films as well to you know, keep them going. And Boys of Rock was an example you just cited. So. And to Jason's, Jason's point about, is this on? Yeah, to your point about wanting all rights, would that mean that if you stumbled across something for you, you that your division that you thought was bully, would you march it into Harvey and say, we need to get behind this theatrically, A, and if so, uh, what, would you, what would you arguably put behind something like that? Well, Tom and I, everything that we are doing at Radius has a theatrical component, first of all. So uh, we utilize a lot of the resources of the parent company, especially on the theatrical side. We use the theatrical booking arm of the YC company, which is helpful, obviously. Um, but 
in fact, if you bring up Bully and, and Undefeated was another example. We actually had these conversations with, with, with Harvey about whether or not those were films that would have made more sense for us to release in our model. And our model you know, is more about doing either day and date or pre-theatrical VOD releasing. And quite frankly, in both of those instances, we told Harvey, these are films that you should release. Because these are films that, that, that need sort of the traditional theatrical push that, that only you and other you know, theatrical distributors of, of, of his size um, can, can provide. And uh, so it's, it, it made more sense for, and, and I think what you've seen, what they've done with Bully has been absolutely brilliant. Um, even Undefeated, getting that film to win the Academy Award is just amazing. It's an amazing film, but the fact that they're able to do that. So, in those particular cases, those were things that made a lot more sense to do a traditional release, which is something that a company, like the parent company, could do. For us, doing a doing a, a day and date or a pre-theatrical release, it's a lot of pre-theatrical of VOD. It's a lot different calculation because you need to have a certain element there that's kind of built in that gets the audience charged up without sort of the profile that you often get from doing the theatrical, what comes with the traditional theatrical. So it's just it's a different calculation. So un unless <clears throat> somebody has something, excuse me, I swallowed a cricket. Uh, <laughs> funny how that happens. Uh, unless somebody has anything they're dying to say, I think it's important for us to open it up to everybody here so that they can, you know, stick pins in you. <laughs> yeah. um, Stephen, uh, P.T. Barnum, who's known to have been a pretty good marketer, once said that nobody ever went broke underestimating the intelligence of the American public. Given that, is that the stumbling block for the confluence of commercial viability and um, great documentary art? I think that's an interesting point. I'll, I'll let, obviously, the four of them answer it because I'm not here to answer it, but I'm dying to. Uh, <laughs> but I do think that there is, uh, you know, one of the stigmas in the doc world, at least as it relates to commercial viability, is that it's, they're often seen as didactic and you know, and, uh, and, le and, and a lesson of some sort. <clears throat> and I personally, I try, and I think it's important for all documentarians to try to uh, tastefully inject, regardless of the subject matter, uh, an entertainment quotient. And I think you have to be able to, you know, for instance, and forgive me for digressing, there's this movie, The Surrogate, at Sundance, that I'm involved with, it actually started as a documentary uh, that won an Academy Award called Breathing Lessons in 1999 by a girl named Jessica Yu, it's brilliant. Um, it's not, it's not that movie. It's the story of the man who she profiled, and um, <clears throat> the reason it actually got the traction it got is because it's funny. And <clears throat> while on the surface it's, it seems like it's impossible to market a movie about a, gu uh, a guy in an iron lung, paralyzed from the neck down, you know, trying to find somebody to have sex with him. Um, strangely enough, Fox Searchlight had picked it up, saw it as an as a very, very commercially viable film because from the first moment of this film we had, a, we had a, a laugh. We were able to have fun with it. We didn't have to take it you know, as seriously as we thought we would have to take it. And so while very serious in subject, it was extremely full of levity. Uh, it was full of levity and I think that gave it, that gave the audience the opportunity to really enjoy it. Uh, I think we need that more in most documentaries, and I suppose you can all address that as well. I mean, uh, let me say, this is going to sound good, this is positive. We have a pretty high opinion of our audience. Um, the general PBS viewing public is, well, the ones that watch POV are looking to be challenged, and we are hoping to challenge them. But they're, they're, they enjoy reading subtitles. Some of the older viewers maybe wish they were bigger. But the, uh, we, you know, we showed Steam of Life last year, uh, observational film take, that takes place only in saunas in Finland. Everyone is naked, everyone's overweight and sweating. Um, it did really well for us. Obviously. So it's a fetish film, though. <laughs> so I mean, just to answer to, to what you said, I just say like just just like narratives. I mean, they're different documentary filmmakers have different styles. You know, I. I love Morgan's Spurlock, but I don't want to see Morgan direct Bully, you know? So I think it, a lot of it depends on, on who the filmmaker is, what their style is, the type of movie they're good at making or want to make. Um, so 
Yeah, I think that's a very good point, which is, you know, you mentioned Unraveled, the Mark, new Mark Simon film, and, you know, you can't go back and show what, what uh, Mark uh, Dreyer was doing, so they use this sort of stop animation to show some of the scenes of, that are being described uh, by this man. And, and similarly with The Imposter, which I thought, by the way, is a brilliant film. Loved it, loved it. And, you know, again, you can't really go back and show what this guy was doing, so they use these animations, or not animations so much, but recreations to sort of unpack, you know, what was going on. And you sit there and go, oh my gosh, is this for real? Um, so how you, as a filmmaker, approach the material conceptually. I mentioned Kim jong il before. I forgot to mention that N.C. Hyken is a choreographer and a dancer. So she created these really interesting, eerie dance sequences with Korean dancers that sort of illustrated some of the things being described by these men and women who had escaped North Korea. So again, approaching things in a very conceptual way and kind of working outside of the proverbial creative box. And the, and the P.T. Barnum of our world is Michael Moore, right? I mean, who's more brilliant at taking big ideas and packaging them in like a, you know, he's got the goofy baseball hat thing. It's a shtick and it completely works. I think it's hilarious. And you know, he's not broke. <laughs> <laughs> actually, in the case of Michael Moore, he's actually become a celebrity, so that's how he, be, and I, mean, I think that's more than anything the reason, more than any other reason of why his films, I, I like his films, and I think he's kind of brilliant, and he speaks to my politics. Um, but he's a celebrity, and rarely do you find a celebrity in the doc world, and Morgan Spurlock's become that. Um, any uh, other questions from Michael Moore? Sure. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about uh, crowdsourcing and the impact on uh, you know, filmmakers, whether it allows them to sort of disaggregate and uh, you know, exploit individual rights. Uh, does that affect what you guys program on to a you know, daily level? It seems to me crowdsourcing allows people to hold on to their rights, which is a key component to what Jason was talking about. You know, if you can. If you can make your, if you can raise, and I don't know how much you can raise on, on Kickstarter, but I'm assuming you could raise $100,000 or $200,000, you could make a documentary for that. Then you would control all your rights, unless James has bought them on Kickstarter. <laughs> 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 but I think it's, you know, I think it, it's, a, it's a great new resource. You, know, it's, you don't have to wait for three years to hear back from a foundation. Um, We've seen filmmakers sort of parcel out pieces to uh, crowdsource. First film of the season this year, My Reincarnation, is working on a $50,000 campaign, I think, for press or for the broadcast, which we're helping with, but she's out there looking for that money herself. Uh, Granito, the second film of our season, did, I think, $30,000 on Kickstarter for a theatrical. That's what you were buying into on Kickstarter, was getting Granito into theaters. That's just a small piece. It would generally be something you'd sell. Um, and they were successful. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. A lot of it depends on the uh, the topic too. I I'd be very interested to see, and of course hindsight is better than twenty twenty. But if Food Inc. came along now and they said, we know that there's this built-in inherent audience that cares about these food issues, why would I need to go to a participant or somebody else to get the money to make this movie? Why don't I just go out there and hit up that world and be able to do whatever the hell I want to do with this movie? I think that would be fascinating. Because I think there will be a subject, there will be a topic, there will be a filmmaker who will be able to take that and take it to such the next level, which sort of potentially changes the game. I, I had a very interesting thing happen. I'm involved with a fairly obscure little documentary called Ride with Larry about a cop in North Dakota who came down with Parkinson's disease, became a baker, and is riding his bike around the state to draw attention to the cause. Not a commercially viable film on the surface. Uh, may not be, you know in its completion, but we, we have a little money into it, and we put it on Kickstarter to try and you know, get a little more money to finish it. And somebody donated $50,000 anonymously because it resonated with them. So you never really know what you have until you put it out there for, for people because there's always something out there that's gonna click with someone. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, let's work, okay, and then we're gonna work this side of the room, sorry, go ahead. Okay, um, yeah, we're... <coughs> Clearly heading into a VOD world, um, and as you said before, a non-DVD world. But DVD is where you could sort of project a bit of revenue 
coming in down the line, and it's really, really hard to determine where money's, you know, any kind of business model for DOD. Where do you see that heading in terms of documentaries in the coming years? Um, and also, you know, Molly, where does that impact any kind of uh, deals with broadcasters? Because you generally want DOD rights, don't you? We haven't done a deal together, but you actually, um, a &E right now, and I hope along with this last, but we don't take the Netflix rights. The, every, w w what's become most valuable now is the Netflix streaming rights. And um, a and &E, because we're not HBO, I don't know if HBO, but they, they are very aggressive about those rights. PBS, I think, is also very aggressive about those rights. POV, not so much. I think we, we negotiate um, VOD, but there is free VOD. So there, there are a million different ways to do things, but we are one of the networks that you know does not, for, for all of our serious stuff, yes, we take the transactional rights, but we don't on, on the film deals. Um, but you know, in terms of how projecting revenue, I mean, there's so many different ways that you must have done your films before. You must, were you selling them yourself, or were you, and, and is that how you were projecting revenue, or were you taking an advance from a distributor? Pre-sales to broadcast. Um, so well, how does that change now? Uh, it doesn't, except they all want VOD rights, <laughs> um, which, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's very tough. You know, but and, and your point is they're it not It just paying. makes it very tough to get chase any kind of investor money because where can you show payback on investment? Can um, you define VOD for, the, for this purpose? Because it's really VOD in three forms. It's VOD as free VOD, which we will, we will require when we license a film. We, we keep that too. Yeah, there's, there's pay-per-view, transactional VOD, which we don't require. Uh, and I'll put electronic sell-through, say iTunes, in that bucket as well. And then there's subscription VOD, which is what Netflix is. Right. And we, we generally don't acquire those rights because, well, surprise, surprise, we can't afford them. Um, and, uh, um, but, but also, what we will do is we'll usually work with a filmmaker or distributor to do some kind of windowing. So we have some kind of period of exclusivity. Um, so again, more specifically, do you mean all three, or do you mean one of those three? You know, that's part of the problem is it's hard to define VOD because it's a very confusing area. Um, I don't know. I guess Shifting sands. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, guess, I guess the bigger question is in this world of you know younger people now getting their media online and and. Uh, you know, just even exhibition platforms shifting to smaller and smaller screen sizes and stuff. And uh, is the story-driven documentary, you know, the 90-minute feature-length documentary, a kind of dying form, given where this audience is now growing up with expecting stuff now, shorter, whenever they want? Wow, that is it. I would say no, to answer the last part. Uh, as far as <coughs> our approach to, to uh, what we're doing, and we've been described as a VOD label and what have you, which is we're not, but we try to approach it by saying a screen is a screen is a screen is a screen. And so there are some people, whether they're old, young, or somewhere in between, who prefer to watch their films, feature length, or any sort of content on their phone or their iPad, or at home in their 65-inch television set, or in a movie theater, and it could be a multiplex, it could be an art house theater, it could be whatever it is. But we don't really care, as long as they are consuming that context, they want to see it. And so our whole goal is to provide the opportunity for people to be able to see it and consume it the way they want to, when they want to, and how they want to. So it, as far as the definition and what this all means, we look at it in the first window, it's all first window transaction, whether you're buying a ticket at a movie theater, or you're pressing play on your on-demand service, whether it's your, 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 Com your Comcast service, or even as an iTunes rental, whatever it might be. Now, does that complicate things when trying to put all these things together and figure out what people define, or how people define these things? Yes. I think all four of us probably have a different definition in our heads for what VOD ultimately means. Does it make it that much more complicated when you're trying to come up with your projections for financiers and all the rest of it? Yes. And it does for me, too. Because quite frankly, some movies we found work well on iTunes and don't do as well on your VOD cable services and vice versa. 
Some films still do much better in theaters than they do on VOD. And I'm talking about documentaries here. It's, it continues to be this enigma that we're all trying to figure out. And I, I'm sorry to say that and, and kind of answer the question that way, but it's absolutely true. Are those differences uh, generally uh, demographic differences? Demographics, age. Um, I mean, look, a lot of it obviously comes back to content. Um, some of it's basically people, you know, there's, there, there are certain types of docs that people traditionally have gone to see in movie theaters and that's the way people still want to consume them. I don't know. It, 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 I, I wish that we had like a pattern, but you really don't. Anything from this side of the room? Yeah, yeah I have a question about, so when you're considering acquisitioning the one that's finished or as it's being completed, how important is it that the filmmakers have some idea of their acquisition strategy? You know, they come to you and say, like, this is the audience, this is how we're going to reach them, or it can be as simple as, like, well, we think these are the communities that we will play best in. And when you are considering buying, how big of a deal is that for you? It's a very big deal to us. And, you know, we, our primary means of marketing is by connecting with organizations that may be affiliated with a film. Uh, we premiered a film uh, on uh, called Conviction uh, about Clarence Elkins, who was released from prison after 18 years through the work of the Innocence Project, which was mentioned uh, during this, uh, this panel by somebody. And uh, Jay Kelly, who's sitting over here, worked out a deal with the Innocence Project along with the filmmaker to promote it to the various branches at the Innocence Project that this film was premiering on Documentary Channel on this day at this time. And so very helpful, and the ratings were very good for us. So the more a filmmaker comes and says, I have organizations that are interested in this, that have backed me, that have helped me along the way, and they're willing to connect uh, and, and communicate the, uh, the various means in which this film is available to their constituents is very helpful. It's not something we look at uh, until the film has made it through our programming process, but that's not to say that it's any less important for you to submit that material with the film so that it's there and we can talk about it. Um, it's just, you know, we distribute DVDs to our free screeners. We don't distribute your outreach plan, but I hold on to it. I think it's more important in the doc world than it is in the narrative world. Um, I, wanna, I wanna say a quick thank you. What I love about the speakeasy is you have somebody like Doug Block and a young Turk from Kartemkin asking these questions. This is very exciting <laughs> for us. Um, Thank you to the panelists. I'm going to ask that you leave them alone for just a minute because we need to take a photograph with them. And then if you have further questions, you can ask them. It is 1030. If you have a film to go to, please go ahead and do that. And thank you for coming. And thank you to all of you. For